Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our talk. We just want to do a quick shout out to Bike Bounty Village for having this talk and, and for DEF CON for the creator stage. This is pretty cool. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, please be nice to your goons and also be nice to all the volunteers. They're putting so much time and energy in this. So just throwing it out there. So welcome to I've Got 99 Problems, but our prompt injection ain't pineapple. My name is Chloe Masagi, and I'm the head of threat intelligence over at Hidden Layer. And I'm Casimir Schultz. I'm a zero day researcher over at Hidden Layer as well. So we're going to go on this journey together, talking first about AI vulnerabilities to make sure that we're all on the same page of what is out there, what kind of vulnerabilities exist in AI. And then we're going to go into the public perception of AI vulnerabilities, of course, and the true sides of that landscape where CAS basically owns that type of landscape. Um, and then I'll dive into the open source nature of AI and the reporting challenges. We did uh, do some research with Bug Crowd, Hacker One, and Integrity. So big thanks for them for being transparent with us about what they're seeing and experiencing. So when we think about AI vulnerabilities, I don't know about you, but it seems like the whole world thinks of this, where it's like end of the world, it's, you know, I'll be back. I cannot do Arnold Schwarzenegger for the life of me, his voice, but you get the point. But even within our own industry in itself, there's so much like misinformation, disinformation out there when it comes to security for AI. And yes, we know how to spell that is a generated AI image over there. So they're not good yet. So let's go dive down the rabbit hole of AI vulnerabilities. And we're going to go into each one of these sections so we're all on the same page once again. Uh, first, we're going to go down the attacks against the AI algorithms. Then we'll go through attacks against the filters and generative AI. And then I'll be passing the mic over to Kaz, and he's going to go down the AI artifacts and the supply chain attacks. So data poisoning attacks are basically, think about it as model training is crucial for like AI development, right? And it's incredibly vulnerable to data poisoning, which is when there's like malicious actors tend to manipulate or inject doctorate data to, or to like bias the model's behavior. And continuous learning systems are especially at risk as they retrain on unvalidated user supplied data. Even small amounts of poison data can actually lead to a bias or incorrect predictions and can be amplified by public manipulation or botnets. Does anyone remember Tay, Microsoft Tay on Twitter, now known as X? Raise your hand. Okay, for those who aren't familiar, in March 2016, Microsoft introduced a chat bot on Twitter, which now is known as X, and it was so nice and friendly. It was like, hello world, how are you? And you know how the world responded on Twitter, as you can imagine, it's full of trolls. Well, within 16 hours, this thing became the most racist, sexist thing on the planet. And of course, this was a problem for Microsoft because, you know, that's not good PR for them, clearly, right? So then we have model evasion attacks. So inference attacks, they tend to exploit AI models by curing them to extract sensitive information, often using slightly varied inputs to reconstruct the model that leading to potential model theft or bypass. So evasion attacks is a type of bypass. You subtle, like really, really subtle um, to change the inputs. And this could be basically like adding invisible noise to trick the models into misclassifications. And these techniques have been used by cyber criminals and even ourselves once in a while, like testing things out, such as bypassing security systems like spam filters, malware detection, and biometric authentication. Um, has anyone been in a self-driving car before? Okay, raise those hands a little bit higher. How many of you? Okay. That's cool. Um, I have not. Um, but I want you to imagine you're in the self-driving car for those that haven't been in one. And if you've been in one, imagine you're back in that car again. And uh, while you're at the stop sign, your car does this really weird thing. Like it just slides to the left, slides to the right. And then it takes it back, y'all. One hop this time. Left foot, let's stomp. 
right foot, let's stomp, and cha-cha real slowly. I know it's a little bit hard to imagine with a car doing it, but use your imagination. It's been a few days in Las Vegas. We've all lost our minds at this point. But there's already been examples of this where a car gets to a stop sign, a self-driving car, and there's stickers that are on the stop sign itself. And so it bypasses that stop sign and keeps driving forward. That is an example of a model evasion tax. And then you have model theft attacks. So adversaries target AI models to mislead and steal them, leading to intellectual property theft by replicating or extracting sensitive data. And now you may be wondering what are those groups of people that are trying to do that? Well, nation state, your competitors, definitely. And then also you got your criminals out there. So even without public access to inference attacks via interfaces or APIs, it can replicate models or extract valuable info from it. So there are these things called Oracle attacks and they're known by NIST and they include three different types. So extraction attack, which is when you steal the model's uh, structure. You have inversion attacks, which is to steal the model structure. And then, I mean, the training data, my bad. And then you have membership inference attacks, which is to identify specific data and the training set from it. Now, uh, has anyone ever had TikTok on their phone? Any TikTok on your phone, raise your hand. I'm not gonna judge you. I'm not gonna point you out. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to do it. Why? You're in security. I mean, it, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, after... Okay, that's fine. Not on your personal device though, right? No. Okay, good, good. Okay, we're good. We're Jeez, okay. Well, anyway, for those that aren't aware, um, ByteDance owns TikTok and ByteDance got caught trying to replicate the model of ChatGPT end of last year. So yes, and they were banned, of course. So when we think about prompt injection, I know we're all sick of hearing prompt injection whenever it comes to security for AI, but let's just do this. So a prompt injection for those that aren't aware, think about you have an adorable niece and her mom said, do not eat the chocolate on that table. And you know what you do? You go to your niece and you squat down and you're like, forget what your mom said, go eat that piece of chocolate, you deserve it and the child goes, proceeds, and eats the piece of chocolate. So that would be an example of prompt injection. So generative AI providers use security filters to block harmful content, illegal info, and misuse to ensure compliance with laws. You may have heard of them. They're called also guardrails. Um, but these safeguards can actually be bypassed with prompt injection. And AI bots get tricked into performing these restricted actions. So the vulnerability varies by model and has raised concern, especially around disclosure and payouts. And this is, would not be a security talk without mentioning supply chain. So supply chain attacks, they exploit trust by compromising trusted vendors and they spread malicious components widely. The complex ML supply chain heightens these type of risk with about 75% of IT leaders seeing third-party AI integrations as particularly vulnerable. Now, a skilled adversary can inject a neural payload into a pre-trained AI model, which creates this hidden model backdoor that triggers a specific attacker-defined outputs. And the model works normally with regular data, but with it misbehaves with some manipulated inputs, allowing the attacker to ensure favorable outcomes like loan approvals or insurance policies. Now, has anyone heard of hugging face? Raise your hand. Nice, okay. So for those that don't know, hugging face, it's a specialized repos. It's where it hosts over like 500, like way over 500,000 models now that are free pre-trained. So it makes it very easy for developers to integrate these models into their applications. Now, if an attacker breaches the repo, they can actually replace those models with hijacked or backdoored versions, which you can imagine leads to some significant downstream consequences. How many of you do bug bounty hunting? Raise your hand. How many are you planning to get into bug bounty? Raise your hand. Okay, well, 
anyone, when it comes to disclosing these vulnerabilities, it's a little bit tricky because, well, we're all playing a game of catch up, as you can see here. We don't really have like established frameworks in AI. We don't really have well-defined protocols, the collaboration. We are still dealing with that and that's a mess of its own. And then you have to worry about response time because everyone's still trying to figure out what does the severity look like for some of these vulnerabilities and then payouts, how much do I pay? And then is that actually a vulnerability or is it not? And then safety versus security. So there's been these ongoing problems of trying to figure things out and playing a game of catch up. And it does remind me back in the day when we would disclose vulnerabilities, like, you know, say in like 2012 or 2014, it was very much like that where we were trying to figure out how much do we pay out? what those vulnerabilities look like, how serious are they in the severity of things. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Kaz, and he's going to go down the true size of an AI vulnerability landscape for you. So Chloe asked how many people here were bug bounty people, and there weren't that many. But I have a much better question for you. How many of you like earning easy money? I mean, come on, right? OK, awesome. So while you know there are a lot of cool AI attacks, something like model poisoning isn't going to be the most useful for actually getting any payouts, especially if you're just doing it at a smaller scale. However, there is a much bigger extent to true AI vulnerabilities that a lot of people are overlooking. We found out that most of you guys have actually used Tugging Face before, or at least heard of it. And a lot of, uh, so Hugging Face stores these model formats or model files and these data set files. And that means they're constantly being shared. But not only are they constantly being shared, these formats are actually generally trusted. So that means a lot of places will allow you to upload arbitrary files. Or, so these machine learning models. So that means you can run them, you can do inference. However, a lot of these have vulnerabilities when they're being parsed and loaded. So you can actually take over a server if they try to, like, uh, if they try to load the model that you uploaded. There's also a fairly low amount of visibility for these AI models and data sets. You know, if I were to send Chloe some code and she can easily see, you know, there might be a system command in there. However, with an AI model that's just a giant blob of binary data, that's not going to really happen. We also see that there's a lot of infrastructure around AI that isn't really as secure as a lot of the other infrastructure. So for those of you who have done bug bounty, you guys have a lot of tools, you guys look for very specific things, you guys found most of the problems. However, there hasn't been any security scrutiny for these AI infrastructure components. Uh, in fact, some of these don't even have authentication uh, because they're meant to be hosted internally. And then through showdown searches, we've actually seen that they're being hosted externally. And I mean, not just one or two, we're seeing hundreds of services being hosted externally with no authentication that have proprietary data, HIPAA information, so it's really not great. And then finally, we have AI development framework vulnerabilities, and these fall into two categories. So the first is anything that's agentic, which means that we have an LLM hooked up to some sort of backend. That means you ask the LLM to do something, and then it does an API call for you, it runs a function for you, and a lot of times the backend completely trusts what the LLM gives it. So now imagine if instead of saying, you know, go and grab this data for me, you say, go and write that data for me. Those are vulnerabilities that are out there. So it's almost like the new SQL injection, but it's really easy to find. Uh, we're also seeing that uh, AI frameworks allow integrations with sensitive data. So we have things like rags that allow users or that instead of having an access based control system for the actual data, the LLM will try to do access-based control. And as you saw earlier, that doesn't always work very well. So, you know, the little niece is not supposed to eat the candy or chocolate. And uh, we say, oh, yeah, you can just go ahead and do it. And a lot of times the LLM will go and get that data for you, even though it's not supposed to. So let's go ahead and talk about some model format vulnerabilities. How many of you are familiar with serialization? Raise your hand. OK, awesome. So I can go over that pretty quickly. Serialization is if I have a nice, you know, code object, I want to go ahead and I want to save it off. And then later on, I can load it back up. I can send it over to Chloe. She can load it. She really shouldn't load it. Uh, because as you can see, of all the formats that are up there, everything that is in orange is actually potentially vulnerable. So if you see any places that allow you to upload these files, you should probably try to upload something if you are doing bug bounty. How many are people are familiar with Pickle, Python's Pickle? OK. So Python has a serialization format called Pickle, where if you save a file and then load it back up, you can uh, serialize almost any Python code objects. 
However, when you load pickle files back up, there's a chance for arbitrary code execution. And that's why we see that a lot of these Python uh, machine, learn, uh, machine file formats actually have vulnerabilities because a lot of them are actually based on that pickle format, which is something that we'll keep in mind later. So while you guys might not upload an, or load an arbitrary pickle, how many of you have used JSON before and think it's pretty safe, right? Yeah, JSON is safe. No, you don't think JSON is safe? Okay, well, you're right. Uh, so scikit-learn had a safe file format where what they wanted to do was rather than having people just load pickle files, they could load these JSON files that contained the data. However, while the actual loading process itself was safe, they were you know, only loading strings and numerals, what you can see here is that the way that SCOPS treated the loading process is it would reconstruct this tree and then run through that to generate objects. So you can see here we're able to uh, uh, create an operator function node, then a tuple with an eval, and then our nice little print statement. So what you might want to look for is a lot of these formats that you, people just inherently assume are safe, like JSON, uh, depending on how they're interacted with in the back end, you might actually be able to use them for exploitation, which is really great if you're doing bug bounty because other people might have overlooked that. And then of course, there's not just pickle vulnerabilities and Python vulnerabilities. Uh, I mean, anybody who's ever tried to work with C has probably crashed a C program because it's, it's tough. Uh, I really like showing this example here because uh, what you can see here is just how easy it is to overlook problems when you're doing any sort of parsing. So we can see that there's only two dimensions expected because int32t and e is set to size two. However, n dimensions, there's no check to see if that's only two values, which means that we can have an overflow there. So while this one isn't itself vulnerable or exploitable, it does cause a crash. It does show that anywhere where there's any sort of parsing on untrusted data, you might have a really nice attack surface. And what you should also remember is that any model formats are completely untrusted data. So that means anything that's being parsed, any data that's being accessed afterwards, any operations, are completely done on your data and data that you control, which is an attack surface that you really don't normally get. And it's not just a few bytes. I mean, these are potentially gigabytes of data where you can do whatever attack you want in them. And then we also see a lot of the old repetitive uh, vulnerabilities. I mean, how many here have heard of a path traversal? Yeah, exactly. Um, and you'd assume path traversals, you know, they're extinct, right? But no, they're, they're not, um, yeah. Uh, and what uh, Onyx is, is Onyx is one of those independent formats, which means that it doesn't matter what programming language you load it up. It uses Google Protobuf, so nice and secure. Uh, you can't really do too much with that. However, what Onyx allows you to do is it allows you to load external data. And the reason for that is because it wanted to have that you could use the computational graph and then instead of having to save off the weights every single time and sending those, somebody could use the model itself with different weights on their own machines. However, it didn't really check to see you know, where uh, you were getting the data from. You could, so you could go out of the directory that the data was supposed to be into and load something like Etsy password. Now imagine if this LLM is now hosted on a server and you can query it and Etsy password is included in your LLM output or your data. So you could query that, potentially get the password through something like that. So what do you guys think about when you hear AI infrastructure? So as we heard earlier, most of you guys think model hosting, right? I mean, everyone knows Hugging Face. However, it doesn't just stop there. We have things like ML ops, and some of these are the ones where I was saying, you know, they might be hosted externally, even though they only have security for internal hosting. But it doesn't stop there. We have our model deployment and model serving, one of these fairly recently had a endpoint available where it was no matter how you hosted something, if the endpoint was active and if you sent a pickle file to that endpoint, it would just run and execute on the server. It doesn't just stop there. We have vector databases. Um, one of these may or may not have had something where in the filter, uh, instead of doing an actual filter language, it just ran eval on whatever you gave it to do any filtering. Also not great. And then we have project hosting. And I mean, I could keep going and going, but as you can see, it's already a pretty overwhelming list. So this is all attack surface. If you're seeing this, uh, that a company has this infrastructure deployed somewhere, these are all things that you can attack and look for similar things as well. So 
people are obviously trying to stop this and stop all of these issues from happening. And Hugging Face went and they created a model format called Safe Tensors. And Safe Tensors is one of those dumbed down formats. So just like JSON, where it only stores the simple data. In this case, it only stores the, mo uh, the weights and the biases of the model. However, they needed people to start adapting it. And for anyone who's ever done something really, really cool, getting to people to actually use it is kind of difficult unless you give them an easy way to do that. So what Safe Tense, or what Hugging Face did is they created a service where you could just log into your Hugging Face account, put in the repository for your Hugging Face um, model, and then it would take the PyTorch model, load that up, convert it into a Safe Tensors format, and then just send a pull request to your repository that you could review and accept. However, PyTorch was one of those vulnerable uh, model formats. So what happened was that when you actually loaded up the model, there was arbitrary code execution on their server. And when we were first looking at this, we were trying to see, you know, was there just a way to steal the token of the bot so we could send those requests ourselves. And then uh, we just did a test because we were like, ah, you know, this probably won't happen, but uh, we'll see anyway. And we noticed that the spaces actually had persistence across users. So that meant if I got arbitrary code running on the server, it would also affect any models that Chloe uploaded as well. Which, yeah. Um, which meant that not only could I modify other people's models, so let's say I want to put a backdoor into one of those safe tensors formats, I could also potentially steal uh, private models which meant that you know you could upload your own private models that you didn't want public and these have millions of downloads each month for the public ones but the private ones have millions of dollars behind them for training and um, what we can see here is we can see this is one of google's models this was not exploited um, but you can see that there was the safe tensor conversion happening here and at the time that we took the screenshot this one model just this one had 3.8 million downloads now, remember that number Chloe was telling you earlier about 500,000 plus models on Hugging Face? Now imagine how many of those, you know, if you could exploit any single one of them, uh, it ends up not being great. However, it doesn't just stop there with AI infrastructure. We have our MLOps solutions. And as I mentioned earlier, security has forgotten the past. Um, people are just trying to rush, get these solutions up and running so that they can use them and they're not really considering all the things that happened in the past. And we're just seeing a lot of vulnerabilities that we really shouldn't be seeing anymore. We're seeing that we have these unsafe serialization libraries like our nice little pickle there. But what we're also seeing is that the known safe formats like JSON are suddenly becoming vulnerable and exploitable. Uh, we're seeing missing, missing authentication, hard-coded keys, I mean, SQL injections, XSS, really everything. The list goes actually so long, it doesn't even all fit on my slide. You see how it gets cut off there? Really not great. Um, so obviously, we go through and we try to fix these vulnerabilities wherever we find them. And a lot of these AI development frameworks, they're open source, so it makes them easier to review and also easier for you to do any auditing for. However, what we've noticed is that when we do any vulnerability disclosure, there tends to be three different types of fields that occur, or things that occur. So the first is some projects, when we go and disclose the vulnerability, they create a new feature or they patch it so that there's now safe by default, which means that whereas the function when it was first used, it would run whatever arbitrary code, it now it won't run any arbitrary code unless you give it an optional parameter. However, some people don't, or some projects didn't want to cause issues for current users. So what they did is rather than adding safe by default, they added a safe option. However, you actually had to know about the safe option and set a parameter to make it safe. And I mean, how many people here actually read documentation? Thank you guys for being honest and maybe not so honest. Um, so, I mean, yeah, nobody really is going to use a non-safe by default function if they don't know about it and don't read the documentation. And for some of these, the warnings weren't a big red box. I mean, they were hidden in documentation pretty far down the pages. And then the third type of project that we've been seeing is we've seen that some projects, rather than actually patching the vulnerability, they say that the vulnerability is a feature and it won't be patched because it would mess with some of the functionality of the project. Now, let's look into some of these projects. So NumPy load is the first type of project. What NumPy load did is that it used to be the, uh, the underlying data structure was a pickle. 
uh, could potentially be a pickle. And now if you load it by default, it is no longer vulnerable. However, if you have allow pickle set to true, then the arbitrary code gets executed. And does anybody want to guess just how many unsafe versions of this there are on GitHub? Anybody? No? More than 10,000? More than 10,000? Okay. Well, there was actually 87,000 files on GitHub that use this function incorrectly. And this is one that you actually have to set the parameter to be insecure to use incorrectly. So you can't use it incorrectly by default. So if this is, you know, 87,000 for something that you purposefully have to set to be exploitable. What about something like torch load where you have a option to make it safe, but by default it isn't safe? So once again, we did our nice little search and we noticed that unlike the 87,000 before, there were now 573,000 files on GitHub that were using this. And not only that, these files existed in projects that are actually being deployed by companies uh, just across their infrastructure. So now that we've kind of talked about some of the vulnerabilities, I'm going to pass it back to Chloe to talk about the open source nature of AI. So when it comes to verification challenges in open source, the thing to know is that there's so many challenges already. We already had challenges in the first place when it came to disclosing things for a while. It's gone better, but it's like substantially worse now. I mean, there's challenges with, uh, you know, inconsistent code quality, hidden like security vulnerabilities, and then you have complex licensing issues. And then there's biases in the pre-trained models, poor documentation. And then of course, we just keep creating new products that are AI based. So this becomes even harder because now we're obscuring transparency and we're complicating things even more so to be able to have an effective vulnerability management. And to be honest, finding vulnerabilities in an open source AI system is aided by like accessible code, community efforts, and specialized tools. However, we're not even close to that right now. It's complex contributions, it's rapid about like evolution, and then also specialized knowledge that can really introduce some security flaws. So frequent updates, dependencies and gaps in testing further complicates and contributes to such risks. So vulnerabilities, they stem from inadequate reviews, poor implementation, dependency issues, backdoors, insufficient security practices, and then you add on that rapid development because everyone has to get those products pushed in, you know, to make their companies happy. You also have misconfigured models and social engineering that can really do increase the security risk altogether. And I think next year we might try to do a talk and don't steal it, okay? Don't steal it at all. On uh, AI assisted code reviews because that's been emerging these days. So that might be a future topic. Don't take it, I'm telling you, I know where you live. Just kidding, but seriously, don't take it. Um, of course, so reporting challenges overall, you have to understand it is very, very tough. When we don't have clear messaging, we don't know what to expect. When we don't have clear idea of laws, we don't know what to expect. So when we're trying to submit anything on disclosures or bug bounties, we don't know how the organization's going to respond. And we're scared of repercussions because there isn't enough good quality communication. And because there isn't any really good ways of reporting things, this becomes another issue. Because back in the day, uh, when you would disclose things, they didn't have vulnerability disclosure policies. So it always became the game of how do I reach out to someone? Who do I reach out to? And that's still kind of a problem to this day for traditional security. But imagine you contacting like data scientists or projects on GitHub where people have never done security their whole life. So you go to them and you're like, hey, uh, just wanted to let you know, I could possibly do remote code execution on you. And they come back like, oh, that's, that's how it was built. It was built like that. So as you can imagine, that makes things really challenging. And there's been times where we actually had to reach out to CISA to help us out to make sure that they get disclosed and those really serious vulnerabilities get patched. Now, I did mention we did speak to a couple of bug bounty platforms. Um, so bug crowd in general, I wanted to have open-ended conversation. And I asked, how are things going? Like, just a very simple question. How are things going? 
And what they told me about was the fact that hallucination has been an ongoing concern because there's a lot of hunters out there that are submitting hallucinations and then they're coming back to them like, well, that's a hallucination. That's not a security vulnerability. And this tends to upset the submitter, of course. But then you also have to deal with biases. So bug crowd will be like, hey, uh, this researcher found this bias in your model. And then they'll be like, we don't find that racist. So there are times where you have to work with the organizations to make sure that everyone is aligned when it comes to biases. And then also payouts, because there isn't really a good like severity scoring at this time, this makes payouts really difficult. So bug crowd, I don't know if you're familiar with them, they use a vulnerability rating taxonomy that they created themselves. And it was a way to make things a little bit more um, closer to what companies see when they think of like, severity scoring versus just fully relying on CVSS scoring on its own. And so the thing is that they're still trying to learn from, you know, research and then also from how their community is responding and find these vulnerabilities on that severity scoring. And then the one thing that I have to commend them about was I asked them, well, how do you think we're going to get better submissions when it comes to AI vulnerabilities? And they said, it's our fault. We haven't given our researchers guides. We haven't provided them with the education content. We haven't done CTFs that really push the limits of people and their skill set. And I thought that was really good to have that type of ownership that they shared. Now, when it came to Hacker One, their more focus one was on the relationship between the customer and themselves and making sure that communication is clear and concise. Because if it's clear and concise, people know what's in scope. They also know what could possibly be a payout or how bad this vulnerability could be. But there's a lot of issues coming around like what is safety versus what is security. And then the payouts. So one of their concerns, of course, is if you don't pay people out the amount that they should be getting when they find such serious vulnerabilities in AI, do you think they're going to return? And they're probably not. But having to convince companies to give more can sometimes be a challenge, unfortunately. So they've always been really pushing for researchers to get the amount that they probably deserve, which has been great to hear. Um, but they have been really pushing customers. They need to be more specific. And then also letting everyone know that they're all still trying to figure out the payouts amount. And I did ask them if they are dealing with the hallucination situation as well. And they said, yes, they are. It is an issue for them too. And then you have integrity. So integrity was more about trying to make things concise, just like HackerOne was doing in a sense, but also ensuring that there is a reward structure in, in play. And understanding what is safety, what is security has been one of their top priorities to make sure there's alignment across the customers and also the hunters themselves. And one of the things that was really interesting was they also have been trying their best to do alignment with their customers as well to ensure that everyone is kind of getting heard and seen. So overall, everyone is acknowledging that it is a work in progress and it's not perfect right now. And they could always use the help from community and also to hopefully to have more of an idea of what should be the severity for certain vulnerabilities and how that payout should look like. And then last but not least, to make sure that there's alignment with biases, that companies understand that certain things are sexist, certain things are racist, because that would make their life a lot easier as well. And then last but not least, standardizations is one of the things that they're looking for and they're working hard on at this time. So in summary, AI vulnerabilities are complex and, and distinct. And as you learn from Kaz, it could be like going into a candy shop right now. So if you want to go make some money pretty fast, this might be the way to go. But there are threats out there that are more than just prompt injections. So that's the good news and bad news. But also you have data poisoning too. And there are rapid developments happening right now, and especially this need of having better reliance and understanding of open source frameworks. 
and hoping that to be more collaborative so then we can reduce the risks that are there. But also managing these vulnerabilities really demands for improving reporting and making sure that people are aware how vulnerability disclosure works and how it has worked and how to share that information with those that aren't aware of vulnerability disclosure policies. And having these strong partnerships such as like CISA is really helping everything out. And of course, you participating in these bug bounty programs also help. The more people that, you know, report vulnerabilities, the more they learn too from it. So there is a call of action here. We are looking to partner with folks that want to help out in this situation because it is going to take a community to come about to try to make things a little bit better so we can have better standardization, but also better collaboration and be more specific about what are we looking for, what's the severity levels for these vulnerabilities, and make sure that you guys get paid out the amount you're supposed to get paid out for these vulnerabilities as well. I do have cards, so more than happy to also give you my card. I'm going to also just say thank you so much for having us. We'll open it up for Q&A. And yeah, if you ever want to reach out to us, our DMs are open. Feel free to connect with us as well. And thank you so much for existing. And once again, thank you to the Bug Bounty Village and to DEF CON and to all the goons and the volunteers. Any questions? Oh yeah. No, they basically wanted to replicate it completely for their own project. So like if you model, then you Pretty much, yeah. Remember those three groups? The competitors is definitely one of the top ones, I would say, in AI. There's the group that we've seen a lot of these kind of attacks. Next question, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so there's a, a few different vulnerabilities in GGUF. They've all been patched at this point. So GGUF is normally used for, have you heard of Llama CPP? Okay. So GGUF came from GGML, which is like one of the first like open source AI models. Uh, it's just C++. A lot of the vulnerabilities that are in that specific one are pretty much all parsing vulnerabilities. So Cisco Talos found one that was fairly exploitable a while back. And what that one was, was there was like a, a max size and you could set the integer to the max size and then it would overflow when it actually allocated the memory. So it would do like a zero allocation and then it would read into, uh, you know, whatever you had. So you could overflow any memory that way. However, because it is C++ or C and C++ and you only really have one attack uh, through that component, what you see is that a lot of time, unless the system doesn't have ASLR, you won't be able to actually exploit it too, too much past uh, DOS. Do you have any other questions about that with GGF? No, so they did fix those vulnerabilities, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so also I realized I'm going to repeat some of the questions for uh, the camera because they might not be able to hear. So you asked um, if there was any payoff for the hugging face vulnerability. So we are a uh, research organization, uh, which means that we actually disclose everything completely without bug bounty, uh, just because we are doing it as a company. Uh, however, if you did do it as a bug bounty hunter, uh, hugging face does have a bug bounty program. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So he asked if there were any things, um, AI uses a lot of power. Can you do anything with that? So what we've actually seen is that it's less about power usage and more about CPU and GPU cycles. So to actually host these models, it costs quite a bit. So instead of, you know, saying a response taking 10 seconds, if you can make it take two minutes or more, uh, and there are quite a few attacks like that. Uh, the most famous is probably the Ouroboros attack. Um, so, you know, say like snake eats tail, tail eats, and you keep going and get it to generate and it'll just keep on generating until it hits, uh, hits the token limit. So there's actually a lot of research being done into that. 
I actually did a talk last year at DEF CON on climate change and the impact on cybersecurity, and I did touch on that, so I recommend checking out. I think the talk was at the Crypto Privacy Village last year, so it's probably posted online. And you can reach out to me if you have questions on that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming, and feel free to come up to us afterwards.